Who doesn't love a good mob story? Goodfellas, The Godfather, The Sopranos, The Goldsteins? Turns out that the Italian mafia wasn't the only mob on the block. Immigrant life was tough for all minorities, and some Jews turned to a life of crime in the so-called kosher mob. Despite their very not kosher activities, they never forgot their community. They stood up against anti-Semitism, fought Nazis, and even helped establish the state of Israel. So how should we feel about these Jewish mobsters? Were they heroes, monsters, or something in between? The Jewish immigrants who fled to the US in the 1800s believed they were coming to the Golden Medina, the Golden Country. Everyone in America was rich, they thought. Plus, America was the land of the free, free of pogroms and Cossack mobs. But it turned out that the Golden Medina wasn't entirely free of poverty and anti-Semitism. Most Jewish immigrants kept working towards the American dream, paving the way for future generations. But some took shortcuts, violent ones. For as long as there have been humans, there has been crime. There's always going to be someone who thinks, why work when you can steal? Why follow the rules if you can get ahead another way? By the time significant numbers of Jews began arriving in New York, Italian and Irish gangs were already running the underworld, and Jewish mobsters were ready for a piece of the action. And boy, did they get it. Remember that 15-year period when Americans weren't allowed to sell, manufacture, or transport alcohol? Yeah, me neither, because it was more than 100 years ago. As wild as it sounds now, there was a time when the US government put a lot of effort into making sure that people didn't drink. Turns out though, people like alcohol. The criminal underworld was more than happy to make it for them. For a steep price, of course. Now, bootlegging might seem like a funny crime to us today. Making and selling whiskey? Big deal. But the Jews at the forefront of the bootlegging biz were serious about protecting their turf, which meant eliminating the competition. Jewish hitmen were some of the most sought after in the business. You know what they say. Immigrants, we get the job done. Samuel Red Levine had the dubious distinction of being one of the few orthodox hitmen in history. What can I say? People really liked his work. Some say the Italian mobster, Charles Lucky Luciano, called Red to off his predecessor, helping him take control of the mob. Somehow, Red saw no contradiction between his job and his faith. He wore a kippah, kept kosher, and kept Shabbat. He usually refused to kill on Shabbat, but if he really had to, he would put on his talit, pray, and then go end someone's life. Red is a pretty good name for an assassin, but nicknames aren't everything. One of the most famous and feared Jewish gangsters was known as Bugsy. Cute, right? Until you made him mad. He earned the nickname for being crazy as a bedbug, which I guess was an expression in the 1920s. You didn't want to be on the wrong end of Bugsy's temper. When there were kneecaps to be smashed and heads to be cracked, the guy turned into an absolute animal. When a rival tried to take him out, Bugsy went ham. He snuck out of the hospital, where he was supposed to be recovering from his wounds, and hunted down his would-be assassin. Let's just say, I wouldn't have wanted to be in that guy's shoes. Bugsy was efficient. He was back in his hospital bed before anyone knew a thing. But it didn't take an assassination attempt to take him off. He one-shot a man for cheating at poker. Then, he sat him up and shot him again for not placing another bet. You might be surprised to hear that a guy like that had, you know, friends. But he did his fellow gangster and literal partner in crime, Meyer Lansky. The two grew up together in Manhattan's Lower East Side, eventually forming the Bugs and Meyer mob, because they were very, very bad at naming things. They were, however, very, very good at crime. In fact, they eventually joined forces with the Italian mob to create the National Crime Syndicate. Eventually, they got a little better at advertising. See, Bugsy and Meyer were in charge of the syndicate's enforcement branch, which they called Murder Inc. Enforcement, it turns out, was a fancy word for killing people. Unsurprisingly, Bugsy was Murder Inc.'s top guy. One detective described him as a sadist who got his kicks out of seeing his victims suffering, groaning, and dying. It didn't seem to matter that most of his victims were fellow syndicate members who stepped out of line. But as Shakespeare said, violent delights have violent ends, and Bugsy was unsurprisingly murdered at age 41. The case was never officially solved, but everyone agrees that he was killed by a fellow mobster. According to some sources, his old friend Lansky had okayed the hit. It was a stone 
whole killer. If Bugsy was the brawn, then Lansky was the brain. Known was the beauty, unfortunately. He was known as the mob's accountant with the nerdy looks to match. But it would be a mistake to underestimate the five foot four Lansky. According to an FBI agent, he would have been the chairman of the board of General Motors if he had gone into legitimate business. So far, the story of Bugsy, Meyer, and the rest of the gang doesn't seem very complicated. They were bad guys doing bad things. But zoom out a little, and a more nuanced picture emerges. One that has everything to do with the historical context behind their life of crime. The Jews who fled Europe for the US in the late 1800s were seen as weak, afraid, and unable to defend themselves. Many were careful not to rock the boat. They couldn't shake the memories of their neighbors turning on them. Jewish mobsters, however, had no such fear. They stood up for themselves. They showed the world that Jews weren't weak, and some young Jews loved them for it. In fact, Larry King later described Jewish gangsters as his childhood heroes. That probably has something to do with the fact that Larry King was born in 1933, the year Hitler came to power. Sure, the Jewish mob operated in the US, not in Europe. But Hitler's ideas attracted plenty of Americans, many of whom were poor, desperate, and angry in the wake of the Great Depression. And when people are poor, desperate, and angry, they look for someone to blame. By 1939, there were more than 100 anti-Semitic organizations in the United States. The biggest were the German-American Bund and the Silver Shirts Legion, who claimed that Jewish communists were the root of all of America's problems. Original, right? They'd march in the streets, calling for a return to a white Christian America. Who was gonna stop them? The Jews? Don't be ridiculous. Everyone knew Jews didn't fight back, except when they did. This was America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where Jews had fled for their own safety. And they would protect that safety, even if it meant getting their hands dirty. You know things are bad when a judge and a rabbi turn to the mob for help. Horrified by the Nazis in the streets of New York, Judge Nathan D. Perlman and Rabbi Stephen S. Wise asked Meyer and his men to get involved. They told him he wasn't allowed to kill anyone. But other than that, all bets were off. And though Lansky would have loved to take down some Nazis, he did what his rabbi told him to. He followed the rules. He and his associates crashed Bundes meetings where they threw Nazis out of windows and beat them bloody, chasing down anyone who tried to run. At times, the Jewish mobsters were outnumbered by hundreds, but the Bundists never stood a chance. Lansky was far from the only Jewish mobster who was ready to smash some Nazi skulls. All around the country, mobsters were answering Perlman's call. In Chicago, Al Capone's Jewish right-hand man brought in Jewish boxers to break up Nazi rallies. The Detroit Purple Gang defended the Jews of Michigan, while Bugsy Siegel and Mickey Cohen took care of business on the West Coast. In Minneapolis, Jewish gangsters set aside their beefs with each other to take on the Silver Shirts Legion. They showed up in a convoy of Cadillacs wearing brass knuckles and took care of business. Then, one of the Jewish gangsters took the stage in a blood-soaked suit and warned the next time it would be worse. He punctuated his message with a single gunshot in the air, which is probably the best mic drop in history. The whole ordeal lasted only 10 minutes. It took the Minneapolis Silver Shirts two more violent raids to get the message. After that, they never met publicly again. Across the country, Jews were fighting back, and there was nothing the Nazis could do about it. The mob had government officials on their side and police in their pockets. More importantly, they had rage. Judge Perlman had offered them money to disrupt Nazi meetings, but not a single one took it. They saw what was happening to their Jewish brothers across the ocean. Many had relatives who would be murdered within the decade. This was not a muscle for hire situation. This was personal. Plenty of American Jews admired the mob's fight against the Nazis, but the good vibes only went so far. Jewish community leaders anxious about their reputation spoke out against the mob. Even Rabbi Wise, who had helped recruit Lansky against the Nazis, condemned him in the press. Even hardened criminals have feelings, and Lansky's were pretty hurt. All he wanted was respect. He'd even asked Perlman to ensure that the Jewish press wouldn't criticize him. But Perlman couldn't guarantee that. Lansky's pain makes sense to me. But so does the Jewish community's reaction. Anti-Semitism was rising, and Jews didn't need the mob stirring up even more hate. So when the war ended, American Jewish leaders and regular Jews alike distanced themselves from the Jewish gangs. But soon, another Jewish community called on the mob for help. This one was tiny, vulnerable, and 5,000 miles away. Today, we call them Israelis. The British had controlled the region since the end of World War I, but the Jews were getting pretty tired of being told what to do. 
especially because the British had set strict immigration quotas, leaving thousands of Jews to die in Europe or languish in DP camps. The war was over, the Nazis were defeated, it was time to get rid of the Brits. So a representative of an underground Jewish militia turned to Bugsy. But Bugsy had a question first. You mean to tell me Jews are fighting? When he heard the answer was yes, he was all in. Every week until his death in 1947, he sent money to support the cause. And he wasn't the only one. Fellow gangster Mickey Cohen held huge fundraisers for criminals and celebrities, raising tens of thousands of dollars in a single night. It all went straight to the underground Jewish militias in Palestine. But the Jewish mob sent more than just money. They sent desperately needed weapons. Sure, the United States had imposed an arms embargo against the Middle East. What was an arms embargo to a former bootlegger like Meyer Lansky? He and his mob controlled the New York harbors, which quickly became a hub for illegal weapon smuggling to Palestine. But if the Jewish mob expected the new state of Israel to be grateful, well, they ended up disappointed. When the IRS hit Lansky with federal charges in 1970, he fled to Israel, but he was deported two years later, which broke his heart. His wish to be buried next to his father in Jerusalem would never come true. So how should we feel about these mobsters? Did the American Jewish community and the state of Israel turn their backs on some of their biggest supporters? Or were Jews across the world right to distance themselves from people who made their living by killing and stealing? There's no black and white answer. Good people can do bad things. Bad people can occasionally get it right. And Jewish mobsters were, above all, people. Complicated, messy, multi-dimensional people with damaged moral compasses and terrible decision-making abilities. And occasional moments of heroism. The age of the American Jewish mob is over. But you can't say the same for the fight of Jews around the world. This generation of Jews has a choice. How do we respond to the kind of hatred we thought we'd left behind in the 20th century? But this time around, we don't need gangsters to fight for us. We have a sense of Jewish pride and strength, one that is rooted in thousands of years of Jewish values. The Jewish refugees who came to the United States fled their homes in search of dignified lives. But Jewish gangsters were seeking more than just dignity. They sought power, the kind that comes at others' expense. They confused might for right and violence for strength. Ultimately, these choices cost them everything. Figures like Lansky and Siegel are a cautionary tale, a warning to all of us that power should be wielded carefully.